Welcome everybody to the School of Sacred Mysteries. This is class two of the first course of the master's course in alchemy at the end of the cycle. And I have, of course, our teacher with us, Robert E. Cox. Hello, Robert. Hi, Hi Deborah. Uh, we're going to cover a few chapters again in Pillar of Celestial Fire. And I want to start by reading a few paragraphs from the introduction to set the context of the whole course. There are times in the history of human civilization when changes from one epoch to another must occur, when everything that has been built up over thousands of years must come crashing down and a new world must be constructed based upon new principles and new knowledge. It is at these times that a new perspective on the purpose of human civilization and life as a whole becomes established, a perspective that may endure for thousands of years until hoary with age and stiff with meaningless tradition, the original inspiration becomes lost and a new holistic perspective must arise once again. Although such changes are essential to all forms of life, our entire planet is now on the verge of an epical transformation of a scope and power unprecedented in our recorded history. This type of earth-shaking transformation has not occurred for at least 13,000 years since the end of the last ice age. However, we should not despair. Our civilization will not be destroyed totally. It will be transformed, transfigured, and replaced by a new civilization, a civilization that will be filled with spiritual grandeur and scientific achievements incomparably superior to anything with which we are now familiar. In this book, we will explore the mechanics of this transformation in light of the wisdom of the enlightened seers of the most ancient traditions of knowledge on earth. Would you like to comment a bit on that pas these passages, Robert? Well, that was kind of taken from the first section of the introduction to Pillar of Celestial Fire. And I wrote that book in 1996, published in early 97. Um, and, and even then I saw that there was a, a major transformation coming uh, for our planet. Um, the details and timing of that is more specifically laid out in my upcoming book, The Final Event, Dawn of the Age of Truth, which should be published by First World Library, I think, uh, sometime this spring. Um, and uh, it's true uh, that uh, everything in life is governed by, by cyclic processes. You know, even on an individual level, we're born, we, everybody is born, and then they go through infancy and then childhood, teenage years and then adulthood, and declining adulthood, and finally uh, maturity, old age, and death. It's a cycle, it's a cycle that's built into um, the human physiology. And um, uh, it's true in nature as well. I mean, nature goes through its youth and spring, it's... Um, it's young adulthood in summer, it's declining adulthood in the fall, and it's old age in winter. It's kind of the same cycle. Uh, it's true also with societies, and civilizations, and cultures. Um, and uh, there have been, of course, many, many different civilizations in different parts of the world that have risen and fallen, uh, but they often go through similar patterns, cycles, and so on. What I'm talking about here, though, is something very, very large and long scale, and something that was mapped out by um, specifically the Vedic seers thousands of years ago, and uh, it's a cycle that spans um, some 13,000 years, but that is only part of a larger cycle that spans 26,000 years tied to the precessional cycle of the Earth around its own axis. And that is even tied to a larger cycle, which is 52,000 years, which involves two complete processional cycles. Um, and so, yes, we are on the verge of a transformation here. We stand at 6 o'clock in the morning with the cosmic clock at our current point in history. And uh, we're about to begin an entire new epical day, which 
is a whole new ball game. And um, it's pretty clear that um, on the surface that um, some of the causal factors that will be involved in bringing down the old system are economic. Um, and I go into that much greater depth in the final event, which I actually peg the, the timing of the entire cycle to the uh, passage of the Federal Reserve Act in 1914. And of course, the Chinese uh, sages used to say that the uh, the end of a thing, the seed of uh, the beginning of a thing, contains the seed of its own destruction. And I specifically uh, talk about that in respect to the 96-year gap between the end of Kali Yuga or the end of the Age of Darkness, spiritual darkness. There's a 96-year gap that the ancients predicted, which would be in between that and the coming Age of Truth, the Sat Yuga, which is due to due to have its onset any time now. But this 96-year gap has been dominated by the most rapid and turbulent changes in the structure and nature of human society that we've ever seen, accompanied by the loss of, well, estimates vary, but somewhere between 60 and 120 million lives due to human intervention over the last 100 years or so. So yeah, it, it matches perfectly the end times described uh, by the ancients. And we are, we are facing a major transformation in human society. But as I, as I mentioned here in the introduction, um, if, if that's all we see is the destruction, then we're missing the boat because it's the story of the age old story of the phoenix. You know, the phoenix is the, is the bird who immolates its old body in the sacred fire, which its old body is reduced to ashes. It's a self-sacrifice. But from those ashes, and it was for a purpose, from those ashes, a new immortal body is structured in which the phoenix then ascends into the bosom of immor immortality and, and infinity. And uh, this is the kind of transformation that our society is about to undergo. And so, yes, there will be some very hard times coming, but those hard times will, which basically dissolve the old, will make way for the new. And that new, what's coming, is... In the in ancient terminology is Sat Yuga. It's the age of truth. It's the age of age where a whole new set of laws and principles will be brought about, and where science itself will be transformed. And um, we're we're about to have a spiritual science that will dawn on Earth that links. That's really a science of consciousness that links the understanding of of consciousness and matter under a single theoretical and scientific umbrella. Robert, may I interject something at this point? Um, because on the positive side, you have said that even though we are going through this uh, rather dark transformation where we will see a lot of destruction and uh, loss and chaos, uh, nevertheless, there will be some of us who will survive that, and those who do will witness this dawn of the golden age and it will bring with it an opportunity as you have said of incredibly rapid spiritual advancement which will also be the hallmark of the Satya Yuga generally the new golden age the age of truth uh, well that's that's very true and and you know what's happening is the system of human thinking that um, has evolved into this very materialistic paradigm where everything that has meaning in life is tied to the objects of our senses. Um, pleasures, sensory pleasures, uh, material wealth is the only real wealth that's it's what gives you standing in society and what enables your family to live and so on um, and all of that but it tends to, to engender a, uh, a 
whole viewpoint on the world that the only real purpose for life and living is to accumulate money and worldly power, and there's really not much consideration to anything that comes after or any other purpose to human life. And so we've really lost the values that was there in ancient times, where in the earliest civilizations on Earth, the overriding and overwhelming view of the leaders and the citizens was that the purpose of human life was for the sake of gaining spiritual immortality. I mean, if you go even back, if you go to ancient Egypt, for example, I mean, you find these, um, you don't find these enormous bank buildings, you don't find enormous government institutions uh, in ruins. What you find is the ruins are great monuments to the gods or some of them aren't even related to gods. They're just huge monuments devoted to things that are mysterious and that we don't really understand. Robert? Yeah? I'm sorry. I think we, uh, we had a little hiatus for a moment. You were saying um, the temples in Egypt, you were speaking of the temples in, in Egypt as uh, being what is lasting and what was present at the time as opposed to governmental or yeah, palatial. They're designed, they're just, the, the expenditures of state back then were designed to... Um, for the spiritual purposes. And, I mean, it's just an indication of the kind of value system that was present back then. It's very different than what's today. Can I interject I mean, today, something here? Uh, excuse me, I want to just mention that there is one temple, the one of the, that Schwaller de Lubitsch, the great uh, decoder in, of Egyptian symbology and mathematics, pointed out at Luxor, it's really a temple to the great man, to the macrocosm of which we are microcosms, and it's all laid out to illustrate the science, the sacred science of, of Hermes, the, of as above, so below. The, so, yes, there were the science that you mentioned that's coming will bring back the sacred science that we have lost from the ancient world. Is that, is well, that true? Yeah, well, I do. And, and um, uh, in my book... Uh, that I'm in the process of finishing right now, which I hope to have published sometime this year, called Transcendental Mechanics, um, which is really a gauge field theory of con it's a gauge field theory of consciousness, and and the viewpoint of the book um, and the starting premise of the book is that the unified field of all the laws of nature is ultimately a, 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 a an unbounded field of pure consciousness, and uh, from that principle everything else flows out, and uh, it's quite a uh, detailed, sophisticated, mathematical, geometrical uh, theory from which uh, the energy states of quantum particles and uh, the, the particle archetypes of uh, bosons and fermions and all these different things that are described. I mean, you can, the, the theory leads directly to accurate predictions of the force of gravity and electromagnetism and so on. Um, the point is that um, this understanding was present at the very dawn of human civilization on Earth, and the ancients actually had a unified field theory at, I'm talking, 8,000 years ago. Um, but they, it was not developed by experimentation and, and objective empirical observation. It was developed through direct intuitive cognition. And the ancient seers claimed the ability to intuitively cognize directly the structure and dynamics that are inherent in the hidden reality of the unified field that underlies everything. And they understood it as a field of consciousness. And therefore, their own, by transcending their own individual mind and merging their identity with that field, they were able to directly cognize that. I mean, the Greeks called it the Logos, the metaphysical Logos. In the Vedic tradition, it was called the Veda. Um, in the Hebrew tradition, it was called the Etz Chain, or the Tree of Life. Um, there are many different... In the Egyptian tradition, it was called the Duat, the foundation of the world, the hidden foundation of the world. And um, 
but uh, they shared a common knowledge in many cases, but they also shared a very they, uh, some of these traditions had very detailed um, understanding of this field and its structures and its dynamics and how it operates. And uh, based upon that, um, the earliest civilizations were rooted in a genuine science. Um, but it was an esoteric science, as, as de Lubitz himself said. Um, it wasn't a popular science. It was an elite science. It was a science um, in which the knowledge was present at the very beginning and wasn't developed over time through experimentation and so on. But the, the public may have been aware of the, the myths and the allegories and metaphors um, that were associated with the science, but the real science itself was the prerogative of a few very uh, enlightened individuals. Um, it's kind of like the same is true in unified field theory. I mean, how many, how many people in the public understand M theory? 11-dimensional M theory. They don't. It's the prerogative of a very few men that um, are the scientific authorities of today, as the ancient great seers were the scientific authorities of the past. I mean, they used a completely different methodology. It was a completely different approach to understanding nature um, directly through consciousness. But um, what I demonstrate in my book is in t transform mechanics is that um, the end results are very similar. Um, so yeah, it's interesting that today, today's um, elite group of scientists who who have access to an understanding of this are kind of they are actually a form of secret society, but it's one in which the secret self selects because there's just a few people who can uh, understand it. And just as as in ancient Egypt, there were the knowledge was secret then, primarily secret and sacred within the temple. And I think that's the distinction actually between the ancient wisdom. It's the element of consciousness, and it's the element of sacred, because certainly scientists today, very few of them, maybe with a few exceptions, would look upon their scientific and mathematical understanding of the cosmos as a sacred endeavor or a bo or, or uh, discerning a sacred body of knowledge. Whereas this very important um, uh, perspective was absolutely held and very... Well, well of course, uh, of course. And it was, it's based upon, I mean, even today, um, you know, modern theorists look at the unified field as the source of creation. It's the, it's the origin of everything. It's the creator. Um, they don't call it God, where the ancients did, because in modern scientific circles, um, it's forbidden to attribute consciousness to this field. Uh, it's just that's just opposed to the modern objective paradigm. Um, the behavior of the unified field is compared to the behavior of a string that's vibrating, cause and effect. Whereas the ancients compared the behavior of the unified field to a mind which operates not on the basis of mechanical cause and effect, but on the basis of self-conception and free will choice. They're very different um, uh, approaches to understanding how nature behaves. But it's one, one of the things that's interesting, and I don't think I've mentioned yet in the few preliminary talks that we've had, is that even in quantum theory, um, it's well understood that nature really doesn't operate on the basis of cause and effect. Um, every elementary particle in creation, it's known, under, it undergoes what are called quantum fluctuations. And these are fluctuations in energy and momentum and so on, which cannot be attributed to any influence coming from another particle anywhere. Um, they're spontaneous. Okay, we had a short uh, inter technical interruption here. What I was getting ready to talk about was um, the fact that quantum theory um, is rooted in the notion, um, which has been well proven, that every elementary particle in creation 
undergoes what are called quantum fluctuations. These are sudden um, jumps in energy and momentum from one value of energy and momentum to another uh, suddenly, and they're called fluctuations, which cannot be attributed to, to any influence coming from another particle anywhere in the universe. And um, to be honest, uh, you know, quantum theorists uh, don't really know where these or how, what's the cause of these fluctuations. They don't understand, uh, and there's no deeper explanation for these fluctuations. Um, they're simply accepted as the way things are. Uh, but what happens, the end result of this, is it makes all uh, predictions, especially quantum mechanical predictions, um, uncertain. Um, if the energy states and the momentum states of the particles are capable of undergoing spontaneous quantum fluctuations, then no matter how carefully you define a particular situation, a particular system of particles, um, your predictions about the future state of that, that system uh, is going to be uncertain. And so what quantum theorists figured out a way to deal with this, and they developed a statistical interpretation of quantum mechanics, whereby um, it's like a roll of the dice. Um, you don't know which result you're going to get uh, in any particular role, but using statistics and probabilities, you can say that a given role will have a certain probability of taking place. And if you do many thousands and thousands of rolls of the dice, um, you find that the statistical theory and the predictions work out. Well, that's exactly how quantum mechanics is, is formulated. Its predictions are expressed in terms of statistical probabilities. Well, interestingly enough, that's exactly how the social sciences deal with the behavior of a collection of conscious beings. You know, conscious beings are endowed with free will. And free will, by definition, you know, given, given put an individual in a particular situation, no matter how well-defined that situation is, and the individual has free will to determine how it will react to that situation. You could put different individuals in the same situation or the same individual in that situation repeated numbers of times, they may re all react differently. So social sciences has come to the same conclusion that to describe the behavior of a conscious being or a collection of such beings to predict its behavior, one has to use statistical laws such that there's a probability that things will, that the, that the system or the individual will behave in a certain way. Which is interesting in the sense that a system of elementary particles, its behavior can be compared to the behavior of a system of conscious beings. That's precisely the view of the ancients. Um, even in the Hermetic texts, you know, made a very clear statement that the cosmos, the physical cosmos, and everything in it, and that means everything down to the smallest elementary particle, is alive and endowed with consciousness. And in the Vedic tradition, this, this unseen influence that governs the fluctuations of every elementary particle in creation was called the adrishta, the unseen influence of the god or of god, of the gods or of god. It's the influence of consciousness. And there's a, uh, a very important theorem in, uh, in the modern physics called Bell's theorem, which is a mathematical proof based upon the axiomatic formulation of quantum theory that any theory that would attempt to explain these quantum fluctuations of the particles to provide a deeper explanation than that provided by the standard model would necessarily and will necessarily be a non-local theory. That means that it must invoke influences, hidden, what are called hidden non-local influences. And this means influences that cannot be empirically observed and which propagate faster than light. 
And that's exactly how the ancients understood the influence of consciousness. The adrishta, the literally comes from the word adrishta literally means the unseen, um, was described as a non-local influence of consciousness. It doesn't propagate at the speed of light, it propagates at the speed of thought. Excuse me, Robert, this is an absolutely fascinating and very high level uh, conversation. I just, can I bring it momentarily back to something that you say in, in your introduction? Sure. You, you, you meant in the section on page two called Collective Consciousness and the Cosmic Life Force, you say, uh, the collective consciousness of our planet may be understood as the sum of all forms of individual consciousness on Earth. The collective consciousness includes not only the awareness of the entire human population, but also the elementary awarenesses of all the minerals, plants, and animals which make up the Earth. This vast collection of individual beings forms a single cosmic awareness. It constitutes a single planetary being that we call Mother Earth. Of course, the particles are part of that as well. But you you extrapolate from that to... to, to bring out a really important and not very often enunciated idea. And I w want you to, to tell us a bit about it, which is the idea that, that we are, in some ways, we, there is a collective aspect of, our, of all life on Earth, and that is why we all find ourselves decaying as a, as a globe, in a way that consciousness and civilization have decayed under the influence of time, really, and cycles, and that it will all be lifted collectively and globally because of, again, the cycle of time. So we never, very, you just don't hear that spoken of anywhere in, uh, in any modern discourse, but it's a very ancient and very powerful idea. Could you elaborate on it, please? Um, well, I think collective consciousness is something that's, that's in some circles, is is uh, bantered about. Um, it certainly is uh, a key feature of the ancient traditions. I, I know, for example, the uh, last sukta, which means the last hymn of the Rig Veda, invokes harmony among the minds and thoughts of all beings in the universe. Uh, so that the individuals f collectively f operate and function as a single cosmic being. And that's the, considered the culmination of Vedic wisdom, is that the parts out of which the whole is constructed um, operate harmoniously to support the whole and to support each individual part simultaneously. And, um, you know, it's kind of in social theory, you have this dichotomy between collectivism and individualism. And there's always, you know, one is individualism is the right wing aspect and collectivism is the left wing aspect. Well, the bird that flies ha he has to have both wings. And, um, and that was what I call holism in, a, in, a, in social theoretical framework is what the ancients viewed which is both individualism and collectivism in a harmony. Um, individual free freedoms and rights and so on um, should be there along with the necessity to maintain social structure and organizations and so on. Um, but if we just rely upon this dichotomy between the right and the left, um, uh, they're constantly at war with each other because no one sees how to bring about this holistic integration of society um, where uh, both can be supported. And but that is, really, isn't that, that a part of the product of the age itself that will be coming? Yeah, of course, the, yes, it is. It, it's, it's a pro this dichotomy, this, this duality that we have now, and this war that we have now between different factions who believe in different things, um, is due to the fractionalization of human consciousness. And there is no glue, really, to bind us together in a harmonious whole. It's been lacking. And that glue is what I talk about in 
pillar of celestial fire as the subtle life force, the subtle matter energy, um, which is mind stuff. Um, we're uh, in a desert right now. And when that, when that subtle connecting influence, um, which is really, uh, I'm not talking about here pure consciousness, because that's something different. That's, that's transcendental, and it's uh, referred to as chit, pure consciousness. I'm talking about what the ancients talked about as chitta, which is mind stuff, the first product, the first most subtle product of the field of pure consciousness, which consists of particles. Um, they're particles that haven't been discovered yet. We talked about it a little bit last time uh, in terms of Higgs particles and so on. But um, this field, um, uh, the number density of particles in this field um, determines how much consciousness is reflected in an individual system and how much consciousness is reflected in between individual systems. In other words, it's the glue that um, binds individuals together into a collective whole. Uh, I'm talking about something that exists in nature. It's organic. You mean it's some kind, It's an organic process in a way? It's an organic process, yeah. I mean, the body is held together, obviously, by some kind of life force in which every cell in the body operates independently, but at the same time, it's, it's operating in a way that nourishes the whole. I mean, how does a cell, uh, we start out with cells that are very similar, but all of a sudden the cells bifurcate and differentiate, and each cell sitting in every organ um, does its thing. Its DNA operates, and its RNA comes and makes proteins, this and other, which is required under different conditions of the body. So, I mean, the individual cells are operating in harmony with the whole. And that harmony is created by the life force in the body, which is capable of reflecting consciousness or reflecting intelligence. It's the uh, software that runs the hardware of the body. And the, the same is true uh, globally on the face of the earth, is that um, every individual conscious being, and I'm talking about everything, uh, down to the elementary particles out of which the earth is, is constructed, um, um, we're all different systems with different layers of, of organization and and, um, and right now the body of the earth is sick. The life force that pervades and unifies all these elements is weak. As a result we have fractionalization in society, fractionalization in nature um, where Everything is separate, disparate, and uh, warring factions emerge, um, each trying to gain dominance and so on. Um, the solution to all of that is not something that we can implement on the level of action and on the level of social action and, and you know dialogue and so on. It's, it requires something much deeper. It requires nourishing the planet with more life force. And that is part of the cosmic clock. That's the function of the cosmic clock. There are cycles of where it's like a tide on the face of the earth, where when the tide rises, all the boats rise together. When the tide falls, all the boats fall together. And um, we are about to face a rising tide in collective consciousness where things that seemed impossible before will suddenly become very natural and very possible. And that includes not only, you know, miracles, so to speak. You know, the age of miracles is apparently lost long ago, and, uh, but it's coming back. But it also means that the turmoil, the problems that we have socially, um, which 
seem inescapable and, and irresolvable um, will be resolved. Um, not by any action of any politician or any conquering of, of another nation by war, but because the collective consciousness rises to the point where the dualities and the distinctions and the separateness fades away. And individuals begin to function in harmony with the whole spontaneously without anyone enforcing them to do that. It's because there's more consciousness, there's more intelligence, there's more harmony being expressed in nature itself. And that means the nature, not only nature of the earth, but in human nature. That is so exquisite. I, may I quote you on the same subject on page three of your introduction? You say, the rise and fall of collective consciousness is related to the varying level of luminous life force present on our planet over time. The higher the density of cosmic life force on Earth, the more profound is the connection between the body of the Earth and the field of universal pure consciousness. When this connection is fully awakened, the Earth and all of her inhabitants enjoy a golden age, and the collective consciousness of our planet is exalted to high levels of spiritual realization. This is something we must remember in our hearts as we go through the next few few years um, at the end of this this period in between the Kali Yuga and the Satya Yuga. Uh, thank you about thank you for bringing that out because the sickness of the earth, as you point out, is not just a product of what we've done to it, and we don't have to be beating ourselves up because. We're all at this point in time because of the very nature of time itself. Can you move now, Robert, to discuss what you mean by the pillar of celestial fire and how it relates to this rising tide of consciousness? Yeah, well, the pillar of celestial fire is an archetype. Um, actually, there are um, streams of subtle energy that connect every elementary particle to other elementary particles and every atom to other atoms and to um, individuals to other individuals and planets to other planets and stars to other stars and galaxies to other galaxies. Um, the ancients described it as a cosmic web um, and the, um, the spinner of the web is Maya which is what gives rise initially to Chitta. Um, and, and these streams of subtle energy um, are literally streams of life force and you can't see them with your eyes you can't, uh, not with your physical eyes anyway because your physical eyes aren't attuned to that level of, of nature um, you, uh, there's no um, instruments made of atoms that can detect these things um, because atoms are on a different level of operation. We're talking about particles that are, have infinitesimal spin and that are point particles and that um, just don't, that the forms of matter and energy that are made out of particles that have finite spin um, can't detect them. Uh, it's because light detects like and like knows like. We're talking about mind the stuff of mind and you know we just can't empirically detect states of mind but they exist and and they can only be detected and seen on the level of consciousness by the same way that we have mental eyes to perceive our dream state well the seers as they develop their consciousness they developed their mental eyes to a great degree to where they could actually see these threads of life stuff of life force that pervade everything you know what we see as empty space they saw as pervaded by mind stuff and there are streams um, and these streams are not just linear they're 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 rotating streams um, which can be compared to little tiny uh, vortex tubes or to 
like a tornado that has a hollow core and surrounded by by rotating winds. Um, and that's what I mean by a pillar of celestial fire. The pillar is just a word that I pulled out of some ancient symbology. It, it, these are actually threads or streams of life force. Um, and there are many important uh, of these streams that connect the earth to various celestial bodies. Um, a very important one is the one that connects the earth to the sun. It's kind of an umbilical life uh, cord to the sun. I mean, the sun, earth was is, is like the offspring of the sun, and um, there's an umbilical cord that connects us to the center to the sun. There's also an umbilical cord that connects our our solar system and every planet in it to the center of the galaxy. There's also an umbilical cord that connects us to the center of the universe. And all of these connections, these subtle connections that exist on the level of mind or mind stuff are cyclic in their operations. Um, they're not only rotational streams, but they also have longitudinal waves that propagate along these streams. It's like, just like, the, you can think of it as being like the heart and the arteries that go out from the heart. Well, there's an impulse of blood that flows along the arteries every time the heart beats. And that delivers nourishment to every cell in the body, those impulses of of blood that flow through the veins. It's a pumping mechanism. And the same is true in the universe. I mean, the cosmic body operates very similar, except that the blood, the rasa, in this case, is mind stuff. It's life force, which pervades the cosmic body, and it has its own circulatory system, so to speak. And that is what causes the planets and the beings that live on the planets to rise and fall according to the cycles of time, which are related to wave cycles. But, but you know, because everything is connected together non-locally by these this unseen influence of consciousness, the ancients were able to see that the, the rotational, the, the processional cycle of the Earth is directly related to these this rise and fall of collective consciousness on the earth, the rise and fall of mind, of luminous life force on the earth. It's all connected together. It's like, you know, the old Chinese process of throwing out some tea leaves and being able to read anything that happens in the universe from a set of tea leaves because everything is non-locally connected. And, and, you're, uh, and, and you say specifically that the, in this case... Um, What's the pillar that you're referring to in the title of your book is a, a luminous wave that is coming directly from the center of the universe. So I have a question about that. I'd love you to expand on that. But I also want to ask you, does that mean um, that other planets and other um, aspects of our universe will be experiencing simultaneously the same renewal, the same age of truth? Or is it more like um, the meridian system in the body where the energy will go to a certain area first and then going through cyclically through different meridians. Uh, and so maybe it doesn't all happen in the same universe at the same time. Do you well, well, we're, no, I believe that what's happening here locally on Earth is happening elsewhere in our, in our vicinity of our galaxy. Mm -hmm. um, that um, although... You know, there's a, there's a, uh, you know, as I was saying before, every type of individual being has its own life cycle. It has its own cycles associated with it. I mean, the life cycle of a dog is not the same as the life cycle of a human being. And the life cycle of an atom is not the same as the life cycle of a, of a solar system. Um, uh, everything in, in creation has its own specific identity and its own specific laws that govern it. And what I would say is that um, uh, there are the ancients also mapped out cycles of time that relate to our galaxy, for example, 
and they use the same terms, you know, Kali Yuga, Sat Yuga, Treta Yuga, Dwapara Yuga, and so on, for, to mark out the four ages that map out the time cycle of the galaxy. But the but the but the galaxy undergoes a life a, a cycle over a period of four million three hundred twenty thousand years, whereas on Earth it takes about twelve thousand nine hundred sixty years. And the difference, uh, actually twelve thousand, um, both both of these things leave out the gaps between it's just, because it's a um, for a variety of reasons. But the ages themselves span twelve twelve thousand years. But there's gaps between the four ages, so it spans it to 12,960. And you obtain the celestial cycle that relates to the galaxy by multiplying each human year, each solar year, by 360, which, which 360 human years marks a celestial year of the gods that, dwell, that live in the center of the galaxy. Um, something that the that the Vedic seers referred to as the, the bulge at the center of the galaxy was known to them as Mount Meru, which is where all the gods dwell. At least the galactic deities, whatever you want to call them. Uh, I mean, I don't, they're probably beings, um, but but they're probably celestial beings, which means stars. Um, the radiation at the center of the galaxy is known to be so intense that almost no biological beings like us could live there. This seems to be the locus of the, the focus of the locus of the Mayan culture and what people have been speaking about so much in relationship to the 2012 date of the Mayan calendar. It's more connected to galactic center than the universal center that you're speaking about in your book. And I find it very interesting that these two cycles in a way, uh, like gears mesh so beautifully uh, at this particular moment in time, it's it really enhances the uh, the monumental significance for life on Earth of the moment that we have arrived at. Uh, yeah, there there, um, you know, various cultures have predicted this decline of spiritual awareness on Earth. Uh, over the long course of time, and many of the great monuments and and scriptures were written specifically to endure through this age of ignorance that we're coming out of, um, so that they might be rediscovered and and reunderstood um, by a generation. Um, in the words of the Hermetic text, more worthy to, to receive them. Um, but uh, it, it's uh, the point is that it's, it's a destined thing to happen, and it's a natural thing that's happening. I mean, you can compare it to like when we get sick in our own human body, you know, for example, we get some kind of, a, of an intestinal flu which is due to the growth of bad bacteria in our intestines um, or viruses in our intestines and the body naturally reacts by flushing the intestines and um, in the process you know many good bacteria and many bad bacteria are all wiped out together but what happens afterwards is the conditions are created for where the good bacteria flourish unfortunately uh, human beings right now are like bacteria on the face of the earth and the uh, bad strains of bacteria are dominating. And nature, not really due to anything that... I mean, there's, there's a tendency, I think, in a lot of people to want to ascribe blame for what's happening to some individual group of individuals. And it's natural to want to do that. And, um, and there's good reason to do it in many cases. But ultimately, from a big, much broader perspective, um, what's happening on Earth right now and what's going to happen in the next few years is preordained. It's, it's, it's part of our collective destiny. And it's been known about thousands of years ago, and, and it just happens to be in our lifetime that this is coming to be. And uh, there will be a cleansing of the Earth and a subsequent revival. You know, it's like you can think of it as like the flood described in the Bible, you know, where things were bad and 
God came down and washed the face of the earth with a flood, and then humanity started again anew. Um, I, I think that's kind of a parallel, <coughs> excuse me, a parallel type of cleansing that's going on now. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. You you have a beautiful uh, description on page five, paragraph three of this this energy that's coming from this creator, the center of the universe. And I, it's short. I'm going to read it for the benefit of all. The life breath of the creator flows along the cosmic umbilical cord as a wave of celestial fire. This wave already has been unleashed and now is on its way to our world. When the wave of celestial fire washes over our world, everything that we know will be changed irrevocably. The earth will become infused with the divine presence. It will be set on fire with the ineffable glory of heaven. It's very... Uh, well, I think that that's true. Um, you're not going to see it coming with any telescope, though. Um, because we're talking about a wave of mind stuff. It's luminous. If you can see it with the eye of mind, you'll see it as a luminous thing. And, and let me make a, a point here, too, and that is that the ancient seers did not operate locally. They didn't see through their physical eyes. When I'm talking about the type of seeing that I'm talking about here. It's not something that's conducted through the physical eyes. <coughs> It's conducted to the eye of mind. And this, when a human being becomes enlightened, um, they basically, their awareness becomes identified with the field of pure consciousness, which is literally unbounded, infinite, and eternal. It's all pervading. That becomes identified, they identify themselves then or that field is then identified as their own self. And their mind then becomes the mind of that universal self is the cosmic mind, which is the field of mind stuff that pervades the entire universe. And the seers have the ability to see literally the entire universe in their own awareness as one might see a an orange held in your own, your own hand and they they not only see the entire universe but they see the threads that are connecting and they can see these 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 uh cosmic rays that connect everything in the universe with everything else in the universe and and so it wasn't a matter of just theoretical calculation that they, they were talking about these things. They were talking about something that they were seeing, that they could see. Hence the word seer. Which, exactly. But let me ask you, do you, do you believe that the, the, this faculty of seeing or seership will be a, a universal product uh, in the Satya Yuga for all of, all of humanity? Um, yes, I do. And, and I, I believe that, you know, um, there are many different degrees of enlightenment, and there are many degrees of seership. Um, uh, it's kind of like a light bulb. You can have a five-watt light bulb, or you can have a thousand-watt light bulb. And um, just attaining enlightenment is not the end of the story. It's the beginning of the story. Um, that's what the point that I was making in my book, uh, Creating the Soul Body, where I talk about the process of how enlightened awareness from the point of enlightenment and uh, expands sequentially throughout the entire universe, em embracing a vast spectrum of time-space scales. Um, and with each step of expansion, the seer's awareness embraces larger and larger regions of the universe. And this happens not after death. It can happen after death, physical death. But it happens, can happen, while you're walking around and talking right here on the earth. You know, the seers had their feet planted on the earth, but their minds were soaring throughout the cosmos. And, um, and so with the, I mean, and that's exactly what the, the scriptures say about 
I mean, the old Vedic texts that talk about the dawn of Sat Yuga, they say it's a sudden thing. It's not a gradual thing. It's a sudden thing. Suddenly, um, all the beings on the planet, their minds become as pellucid as an autumn pond, and and the silence is so profound, and their minds are able to fathom things that they were not able to fathom before. And they recognize the Veda, which is the Vedic term for the Logos. They recognize literally the structure and dynamics of the unified field within their own awareness. They begin to operate on that level of nature from which everything has come out. They begin to operate in a manner that is in accordance with the will of God, if you want to say it that way. Um, and yes, we become seers. And, you know, there'll be many different gradations of this, and it won't necessarily mean that one day we'll be ordinary Joe Blows, you know, drinking beer and, and eating our, uh, our uh, hot dogs, <laughs> pork ribs or whatever, um, and all of a sudden we're going to be enlightened great seers. It's not going to happen like that. It's going to take time for that to manifest in human awareness. But what they were saying is that the, the life force – will suddenly rise on the earth. Those who are ready and prepared, who are apt vehicles or vessels to receive that life force, will, yes, suddenly be elevated into great seers. And there's a very another very important aspect to this, which you talked about in your first class, and that was the, the role of alchemy. You referred it to the very, to being in, the primary influence at the be for the earliest Vedic seers, and you speak about how its rediscovery at this time is essentially in preparation to play the same role in conjunction with this great wave from the center of the universe. They will uh, presumably work hand in hand to facilitate this um, this exactly. process. Exactly. I mean, it's again, we're talking about everything is correlated. Um, when, when the life force on earth reaches a certain level, this science, this understanding will become manifest again. It will become a, a part of human society again. Um, and the key, uh, alchemy, uh, is really the ultimate technique to gain spiritual enlightenment. I mean, I, I mentioned before that if you go back to the oldest text in Vedic tradition, you find that they talk about using elixirs to gain immortality. The same is true in the Chinese tradition. You know, um, very scholarly works and, and research has been done, and it shows that the tech, the what's called the inner techniques of breath work and you know working with the chi and the body and all this that's part of the Chinese tradition um, came after. What preceded that was using the elixirs from the metals to attain the same states. In fact, what, there's an early, very early um, uh, author in the Chinese tradition which bemoans the fact that um, in his day, people are becoming less and less attuned to the um, the, the golden elixirs of the immortals um, and that they're moving more into the kind of breath work and so on um, that has now characterized as much of Chinese tradition uh, the esoteric traditions in China um, and so uh, and what is a technique? a technique is the ability to do less to accomplish something um, instead of you know, trying to lift a log with your hands, you get a lever, and you can lift the log much easier. That's a technique to lift a log. You're able to accomplish the same thing with less work. And um, what could be simpler than ingesting a substance? We Let's again reiterate, which I believe you said also in the last lecture, lest there be any misunderstanding. This is not an ingestion of a organic uh, 
uh, psychotropic substance, no matter how high those may be, it is, it's a metal. It's a pro and, and explain the distinction there. Well, it's not really even a metal okay. um, because when even even the ordinary metals, when they go into a monoatomic state, they cease to function and behave as metals completely. They behave as something completely different, um, which resembles a, uh, an, an inert stone is what it resembles. Uh, it's not chemically active. Uh, can't dissolve it in bases, can't dissolve it in acids, like an ordinary chemical, like an ordinary drug. Um, uh, it becomes like an inert stone, and that's why they called it the stone. Um, it's actually a powder, but they call it a stone because it's inert. Um, and, and it's, it's not it's, digested then, right? It does not It's get not digested. No, you can't digest it. But because we're talking about single atoms, monoatomics, um, it's able to penetrate into any cell easily through the cell wall, flows along the blood, penetrates the entire body. But its, it's only value is that it generates life force. It's this little tiny superabundant generator of life force. Well, the elixir operates in the same way but on a much higher level. Mm -hmm. um, we talked about the fact, the notion that these are super heavy elements. Um, but again, they're not going to behave like metals. They're going to behave like inert, an inert powder that when ingested is, but it's that inert powder. If you had the eyes to see, you would see that it is radiant with celestial fire. And by consuming it, your body literally gets filled with the celestial fire. And that fire is purifying. Um, it will generate enormous heat in the body, literally, because it will be burning up um, impurities and causing the molecules and the cells to rearrange, even the DNA to rearrange itself in accordance with the higher level of cosmic intelligence that's functioning in the body at that point. So the body becomes reorganized. And that can be quite uncomfortable if it's done too quickly. Now what's going to happen here is that when this flood of celestial fire comes from outside, from the rest of the universe, onto Earth, um, those with, with enormous impurities in their body are going to feel it. And um, those who prepared themselves to some, ex to some extent will, will feel it also, but it won't be as uncomfortable for them. Um, and, uh, and over time, the, the Earth and its inhabitants will be reorganized. And I'm talking about a reorganization that happens very deep. It, it, per, it pervades the entire structure of nature um, from a social human level all the way down to the level of the DNA and even down to the level of the way the atoms behave. Um, very, very profound. Now, alchemy will emerge to facilitate this transformation um, in nature because by producing this substance we can also nourish the planet um, alchemy and the materials that are used in alchemy can be used to produce agriculturally to produce plants that are just incredibly nutritious and and that yield much greater um, um, have much greater yields uh, if these material, these minerals are sewn into the soil, for example, and that already exists in terms of use, the use of the monatomics, right? There. Yeah, mm -hmm. yeah. There's quite a bit of research that's been done over the last few years, and and it's shown that uh, even the the very weak monatomics and small, you know, density monatomics that are extracted from seawater or from inland lakes like the Dead Sea Lake or other other lakes in South America and so on, um, when uh, distributed in the, on an acre of soil can produce crops that are 20 to 80 percent um, greater yield than ordinary crops, uh, control crops that are there. And also the plants are more resistant. Um, 
uh, in Australia, you know, there's been a drought going on, and there there's research going on in Australia down there. There's research going right home here in my backyard, Louisiana State University. But um, even in uh, Australia, where they have severe droughts and they have uh, crops that have been treated with this uh, with monoatomics and crops that haven't, which are standing right next to each other in the drought, and whereas the crops that haven't been treated are all withered into dust and blown away, the crops that have been treated are still standing and still green, even though both have gotten the same amount of water. And, and also, it, a, are there more nutritious as well? Did you say that? Because we know that, that uh, the food that we generally get today, even when it's uh, organic, it does not have the same density of nutritional value as food used to have. So, yep, 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 they're, they're more nutritious. Uh, I've seen uh, examples, and it's been tested and shown that they're, they're more nutritious. But I've seen oranges the size of cantaloupes. I've seen radishes the size of footballs that have been grown. I've seen walnuts the size of your fist that have been grown using monotomics. Um, it's an amazing uh, uh, fact, and no one can explain it because the monotomics are supposedly inert. So how can they produce these great changes? Well, it's because they're operating on the level of mind stuff. That's what's doing. That's what's producing the changes. And it basically, this mind stuff can operate directly on the DNA of the plant um, and how the plant operates internally to nourish itself. With more intelligence, it has greater ability to draw moisture out of the air and out of the soil. You know, it occurs to me, it occurs to me, Robert, that in, in many ways uh, we have not even defined or explained what monatomic elements are, and that really is being reserved in a way for the third course where you... Uh, sorry, the fourth course where we'll be using your book on the elixir of immortality. And well, we, we get into we get into it in pillar. I get into it in pillar of celestial fire. I have a whole chapter of monotomics, I believe, in pillar of celestial fire. Oh, good. Well, um, we haven't really defined it yet. I don't think. Exactly. Well, we, we touched upon it. Not, I think in the last lecture, I believe we did. Oh, good. It. Okay, excuse me. High spin, high spin nuclei and so on. You're right. You're right. Okay. So uh, this. So for people who are. Are, are saddened in their hearts and, and who, about the environmental situation of the earth, and there's good reason to feel that way. Our home is is degraded, and we're we wonder if how it can ever be cleaned up, and how it can ever be respected and honored again, and brought back to its pristine original self. This these secrets of alchemy, in conjunction with the age that we're moving into, are going to be able to uh, affect an enormous change in nature for the positive. So, I mean, uh, uh, go back and look at what happened 13,000 years ago. I think we mentioned this previously, but in the archaeological record, all of a sudden, uh, around 12 or 13,000 years ago, over a period of about 1,000 years, you had whole new species of plants and animals, fruits and vegetables, grains that, that sprung into existence out of nowhere. Um, the domestic varieties of plants and animals that were required for the development of human civilization over the last 13,000 years sprang into existence over about a 13,000 year, I mean a 1,000 year period where they were not found in the archaeological record previously. And, and it's a mystery how that happened. I mean, the, the mystery of the domestication of plants and animals is hasn't been fully fathomed from a scientific perspective, has it? I, I think it still remains. Oh, no, it's, a, it's a very profound mystery um, to have a sudden radical quantum jump in the DNA because this involves a DNA change. Um, the domestic varieties and the wild varieties are different on the level of the DNA. My thesis is that this was caused by the influx of life force that happened at the beginning of the last Sat Yuga. It basically sets the sets the tone for what's needed for the unfoldment of that cycle. And when when this new phase begins, we're going to find the same thing taking place. Um, you know, uh, many people are upset about Monsanto, who is and, and the whole bioengineering thing of engineering the DNA of our plants, putting sheep DNA in. The DNA of grains, for example, and you know sections of s snipping DNA from this organism and putting into the DNA of another organism to produce certain effects. 
well, they're 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 messing with fire here. Um, because there are mutations and things that happen that um, human intelligence of these scientists who are doing this, they really can't foresee the consequences of what they're doing. And some of these things could and are already proving to be disastrous. Well, plus the motivation is not always what one would hope when dealing with something at that level. Like sometimes, I mean, the most the most well, abhorrent the, well, one they, is to well, the motivation is profit. Exactly, and so they don't want these things to be able to reproduce seed, so that humanity becomes dependent upon purchasing seed every year and cannot. And, the, right. and, and it's stopping the natural cycle of, of the plant's reproduction, which is extremely right. dangerous. Well, my view is that, you know, this is a sad, sad case. And, and it's one of the reasons why nature is coming to reset everything, because this could completely, if left unchecked, could completely destroy the ecosystem of our planet. Um, and this is the kind of thing that ha that destroyed Atlantis, I think, isn't it? Some kind where scientists, the hubris of scientists who were, who had end started to mess around with things at a structural level that they could not foresee the consequences of. At least this is what is what is the legend of the destruction of Atlantis. Well, I, this whole story of Atlantis, in my view, is an archetype. Um, whether or not there was an actual continent on Earth that was known as Atlantis and so on, um, there's, there's some dispute about it. But um, there were certainly... Um, this, is, this is an archetype of a civilization with high technology uh, that went wrong and um, yes and started engineering nature um, based upon for for reasons that were not in tune with the laws of nature and it was destroyed um, and uh, in, a, in a very profound sense we are currently living in a modern Atlantis and which is about to undergo destruction not going to be from a flood this time but it'll be from something else but um you know the universe is very old i mean they're projecting even today articles that have come out in the last couple of weeks in mainstream media is talking about now that astrologers astronomers excuse me are talking about the possibility of billions of earth-like planets throughout our galaxy the possibility of each one of these planets having its own life forms um, the history of, of humanity is very old, much older than the history of humanity on this planet. The human being is an archetype that evolves under certain conditions. I mean, yes, we have different races of human beings, and the, the human beings that exist on other planets may have you know, different skin color and various things, but the archetype is the same. And uh, or they may be larger or smaller than we are. I mean, we, even on our planet, we have variations in all those areas. Um, but we're all human beings. And, um, and human society, how it evolves and the stages it goes through is another archetype. It's there in nature. Um, it's, it's the age-old story, and it's told on other planets just as it's told on Earth. Robert, um, may I make one other Atlantean point, which I, mean, I want to ask you, isn't, isn't that really the, would that have been sort of the, um, the interval period after the last Kali Yuga and before the Satya Yuga that you, that took place 12,000 years ago, probably that, I and mean, that's usually according to the Egyptians and the, and the Greeks who got their knowledge from the Egyptians, they seem to be referring to, to something that happened on Earth, yeah. Right, about that time, right? I mean, it, Well, it, no, it was, it was actually before that time, but it was, um, I think it was about 9,000 years ago is what, well, if, that's, if, you, if you look at Plato's... Thing. No, no, that's what I meant. I meant they're speaking about a, the period uh, prior to the Satya Yuga that, you, that, that last took place. No, that would have been prior to 13,000 years ago. Um, uh, I, I don't know uh, exactly. I haven't really deciphered what this whole Atlantean myth is with respect to the Earth because there's no archaeological evidence that there was a high technology as such that existed on the Earth. Now, at least not a material technology. Now, there may very well have been a high mental technology um, and um, engineering nature by the mind. And... Um, 
Uh, there would have been there would have been at the end of the last thirteen thousand year cycle, um, but that was really at the end of the ice age. Um, in Europe, but was there was it everywhere? The ice age was all all over the globe. Yeah, yeah. The ice age is a global thing. But could could the um, melting of the that, ice that age? Mean wait, that could the, <clears throat> excuse me. Could ice the age. melting of the ice age have caused the flooding of Atlantis? Could that have been the very thing? Because I, I, I point to that period of time precisely because many people work, working in Egyptology, um, sort of the mavericks, have said that, have pointed to the fact that Egyptian civilization arose ex nihil, apparently ex nihilo, out of nothing that preceded it, that could explain how suddenly people, the Egyptians had access to knowledge about the pyramids and building the Sphinx and all of their amazing accomplishments in all in ancient kingdom and some have suggested that certain atlanteans who escaped through foreknowledge came and seeded some of the civilization uh that's been one explanation i've heard uh but you may not agree with that uh, well uh, what we do know geologically is that um from the uh with the onset of the ice age ending to current times the ocean has risen by some 300 feet, 100 meters, um, and inundated approximately 10 million square miles of otherwise previously inhabitable lands on the coast of the continents. Most of the continental shelves during the Ice Age are, and at the end of the Ice Age were exposed and, and were probably uh, places of human habitation. Uh, 10 million square miles is equal to um, all of China and Western Europe put together. Wow. It's a big, big area of inhabitable land. So... Um, that could have been a continent too, as well as just the, uh, the shorelines. It could have been, and, and there's, I, I, I don't know, I recently saw um, a uh, photograph taken of a, uh, a large rectangular um, elevated landmass under the sea off the uh, Straits of Gibraltar out in the Atlantic Ocean. Mm -hmm, um, mm -hmm. That's been done by the imaging technology that's been made available here recently, uh, global imaging technology uh, for underwater stuff. Google Earth, I think, has, has the ability to do that now. <laughs> Um, and some people are saying that that may have been the site of Atlantis. We don't know. And, and there hasn't been um, – underwater archaeology is very, very expensive and uh, has been done very limited uh, basis. So we don't know. Um, we can speculate, but we don't really know. But w what I can say is that the archetypes, the, the, the pattern is, is similar from age to age, from, from cycle to cycle. And um, that – because the, the, the rise and fall of life force on Earth brings about uh, changes in the minds of beings that uh, are similar. Um, so, uh, can you can you explain one thing? I, I wonder if other people have this question in their mind. When you when you speak of the last Satya Yuga, you you go back approximately thirteen thousand years, and yet. The uh, one grander, one grand cycle that you refer to is fifty-two thousand years. Uh, so, how are you saying that there are like approximately four of these uh, cycles yes. within the grand cycle? And do they yeah. are they are they distinct depending upon where they are in the cycle? And is our special mm -hmm. being the begin the dawn of of a brand new day, like at the very end of a fifty-two thousand years cycle? Yeah. I, um Using a natural analogy, you compare this 52,000-year cycle consisting of four watches of 13,000 years each. Um, it really ma uh, corresponds to two complete processional cycles of 12 hours or 12 zodiacal signs each. So it's 24 zodiacal signs or 24 hours in a cosmic day on Earth. And um, the first complete processional cycle, which involves 12 hours on the cosmic clock, um, spans two watches. The watch that leads from 6 o'clock in the morning to 12 o'clock noon, high noon, 
and then from high noon to dusk. And um, these periods, known as dusk, noon, dawn, and midnight, were known to the ancients as transitional periods, even in a daily cycle. And often, I know in the Vedic tradition, it was often said that meditating at those periods is most auspicious because the laws that govern the previous six-hour watch and the laws that govern the subsequent six-hour watch are suspended in the twilight, in the transition between the two watches. And therefore, the human mind has the ability to transcend. It's not gripped by either set of laws, and it can transcend directly uh, at those periods of time. So it's very auspicious times to meditate. Um, but on a larger scale, these six-hour periods correspond to 13,000 year cycles each of which starts out with a Sat Yuga or an age of truth and which ends with a Kali Yuga or age of spiritual darkness um, and these are sub cycles within the larger 52,000 year cycle um, and um, so so the, char the, characterist yeah, yes, the characteristics ahead. of the, the morning from 6 a.m. in the morning to noon are different from the characteristics of the afternoon. You know, we're building up to something in the morning. We're building up to high noon. And then we're, we're building up to something in the afternoon, which is the dusk. So we're ascending versus descending in a way, right? As far as the light kind is concerned. Kind of, yeah. But there mm -hmm. is these, these, this, in every case, there's this, um, f there's a wave of cosmic life force that comes at the beginning and it, it dissipates over time. And then there's another wave that comes 13,000 years later and then it dissipates over time. But each one of these, these uh, 13,000 year periods has its own characteristics, its own qualities. Um, in spite of this rise and sudden rise and then gradual dissipation, each has its own qualities. And um, you can compare these qualities to the qualities of morning, afternoon, evening, and then the period between midnight and dawn. Could you say that the period between midnight and dawn could be seen as kind of gestation, and then the period of dawn as birth, and, and then et cetera, et cetera? So I mean, that like the spring, yeah, yeah. yeah. Say that. So we are really so the the beauty of where we stand right now is that we're, we're entering springtime, La Primavera, the, the re, a rebirth of all things. And uh, that's, that's doubly emphasized or quadruply emphasized by the fact that it's not just a Satya Yuga, it's the Satya Yuga that represents maximal rebirth. Is, is that right in a way? Yeah. Mm -hmm. But there's also the adage that these darkest hours just before dawn. <laughs> yeah. And uh, I think that's also true. Right. Um, that we have reached the, the apogee uh, of materialistic viewpoint at this stage. And um, where the spiritual, hidden spiritual reality of the universe is almost completely oblivious to us. Um, that the only thing that's the majority of the population on the earth views as being worthwhile and the purpose of life is to simply um, live and exist, accumulate wealth and accumulate power and it's carpe diem, live for the day because there ain't much else. And uh, that fosters a whole set of, uh, of imbalances in the human psyche which manifest themselves in dissension and war and all that stuff. Um, but yeah, there's a great contrast that is about to take place. It's a huge contrast from the darkest hour to the hour of the dawn. But in between that are the pangs of birth and they can be quite severe. You know, the birth, if, if and that, and we're in the birth, pang, the birth pangs have started. Is that right? I think we're, yeah, they're, you could they're say. just, it's like, uh. We haven't gone to the hospital yet. Right. The water has not broken. We're, we're, we're feeling, we're feeling uh, 
contraction. <laughs> hey, uh, hey, honey, I've got, uh, I think I need to get ready to go to the hospital. <laughs> yep, I feel a that contraction here. Yet, but it's coming. Um, we're just beginning labor, let's put it that way. Yeah. And, uh, of course, labor is not a pleasant thing for a woman to go through. Can we get nor, an epidural, is, Robert? Can we get an epidural? <laughs> nor, is it, nor is it for Mother Earth. It's not a pleasant thing for her to go through. Nor is it going to be for those of us who are going to go through it. But uh, a baby may be born covered in blood, but it's rapidly cleaned up and it becomes a new life. It takes on a life of its own. And for those of us, I mean, there are those who accept reincarnation and those who do not. But if for those who do, there is the consolation that even if we don't make it through individually this particular cycle to see the, the golden age, it will be a better place to come back to if we if we can if we have the if we have if we've earned the merit to come back to it, it will be it won't be as a frightening disaster. It will be Well know. here's what I envision. Um, after the the transition has taken place. Um, I suspect that the Earth's population will be reduced quite some, quite, to quite some degree. Um, and uh, are we still connected? Yes, we are. Okay. Um, and that I suspect that there will be a profound silence on the face of the Earth. Um, silence so thick you could cut it with a knife. And there will be a great tendency for those who have survived to close their eyes and go within and to experience the, the silence that is so pregnant. And um, that out of that will come, there will be a great um, support for rapid spiritual advancement um, that will manifest itself. And over time, I mean, the, the Manu Smriti, which is the Vedic text that uh, lays out this whole cycle, uh, Manu Smriti literally means the Manu is the Sanskrit word from which we have our modern English word man. Um, and Smriti means memory. It's, uh, Manu Smriti is literally the memory of man. The, it's the oldest and most authoritative of the Vedic text on law, human law. Uh, the natural law for human beings, basically. And um, But it, what it says is that um, when the Satya Yuga begins, Satya Yuga begins, there will be a 400-year twilight before the full sunshine of the age fully dawns. So we're looking at a 400 year period before we have a fully functioning global society operating on the basis of truth. Um, scientific truth and truth in human relations and spiritual truth. Um, that's a long period and it will take time to develop but the seeds of that will be plant are being planted now and will fructify over time and individually um, the realization of that promise can be done relatively quickly um, on an individual level but it will take time to marshal the to the the technologies and the, the things that will enable a new global society to flourish on the earth um, which is operating on the basis of completely new principles not a collectivist society such as communism or socialism and not an individualist society such as the founding fathers of our nation tried to create but a holistic society in which the individual and the collective are both nourished simultaneously 
individual freedoms and individual rights are upheld while simultaneously upholding the collective needs of society at the same time. Through harmony, and basically it may be just the capacity of individuals to harmonize based on the subtle energy, it seems to me, as opposed to any laws well, that's, or... Well, that's right. And, and, you know, what is the purpose of human laws? It's to keep people in line that are basically crooks and rascals and that don't know any better and make mistakes and blah, 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 blah. Selfish. Mm, Selfish and so on. And, 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 and if everyone is largely operating on the basis of this heightened consciousness and heightened connectedness to everyone else, which would be very palpable. You know, I mean, there's the old adage, do unto others as you would have them do unto yourself. Um, and, you know, that's good platitude, but most people don't put it into action. Uh, you know, there's the we and they syndrome. Yeah. And um, self and other, you know. So. Yeah, and you know, I'm not, and that that platitude is not lived up to. Today. But Robert, you know, what's interesting is that um, with the in height, certain what Vedic tradition calls cities or powers of the mind um, to know directly how other people are feeling and thinking is going to be part of what, what uh, brings about that uh, synergy, that harmony, because it'll be palpable, it'll be knowable. You, it will, there will not be that dissociation from the harm that one does to the other person and one's own satisfaction, because it'll be a, a unified field in a way, and of mind and, and emotion. And also, the law, laws don't aren't really necessary in the Satya Yuga, but they are more. They become necessary when the unity begins to break down. Is that what your point was about laws? Well, yeah. Sense? I mean, if you go back and read the uh, Vedic Puranas that describe the previous Satya Yuga that happened some thirteen thousand years ago, lasted for about almost five thousand years. Um, they say it was a time when there was no social social institutions whatsoever. Um, there was not government. There was not. Um, no form of religion that existed back then. There was no, and, and that, this is, I'm, I'm saying exactly what the texts say. You know, I mean, there was no government, there was no religion, there was no royalty, there was no class system, there was not even the institution of marriage, there was nothing that you could say was a social um, imposition upon human behavior. Um, what they said was that, the, that they were talking about the Vedic. Um, uh, tribes that were part of that culture and that tradition. I mean, they weren't necessarily talking about everyone on the face of the earth, uh, but they were talking about the progenitors of that particular tradition. Now, what they said was that um, they were the sons and daughters of immortality, that they were immersed in direct realization of the divine, and they didn't have to worry about uh, food and shelter because these things, because they had the cities, which are Sanskrit word that means mental perfections, but it means the ability of the mind to directly influence nature. Mm. The ability mm. of the mind to actually um, transform nature according to desire. Mm. Mm. Uh, they could make their bodies impervious to the elements. They could um, uh, manifest they, food or something. Well, they could they could find food wherever they wanted. They just they had the intuition. You know, I want food. And all of a sudden, they they run across a bush filled with berries. Mm -hmm. um, so, uh, what I envision for this coming society is. Of course, we're not going to go back to living in caves and living in the forest naked. But um, I envision a society where there are very few actual man-made laws to govern society. Of course, there will have to be uh, trade agreements if that is undertaken and so on. Um, and there will have to be some you know, outline of how social institutions function. Because there certainly will be social institutions that evolve out of this. 
Um, but it'll be minimal, very minimal, because every part will be functioning um, in harmony with the whole. And it's it's we can't imagine that now because we just don't have that kind of consciousness. And we certainly couldn't implement something like that today. Um, we would just rip ourselves apart. I mean, if you if you take away the police force in downtown Detroit, what do you expect to happen? Not good things. Um, uh, but uh, we're looking at a at a, a, a this is this just indicates the the profundity of the type of transformation that's coming. I mean, we're talking uh, like a different world completely mm -hmm. from where we are now. In, in closing, Robert, uh, may we, I, uh, you spoke about going within uh, at the time after the transformation and uh, how natural that will be and how it will lead to high, great rapid spiritual development. But even now, would, wouldn't you say that going within could be very helpful in actually getting through what's the birth pangs? And well, anything we can do now, it's kind of a late stage to be starting. But anything we could do now to um, align ourselves, to make ourselves a more fit receptacle for this wave of celestial fire that's coming would certainly be beneficial. It'll mean more rapid development um, spiritually afterwards. Uh, there are many things that need to be done, but there's also the, the issue of physical survival for what's coming. And uh, we'll talk about that during the course uh, I think it's important for us to talk about it, especially now. Um, I, I don't think we have much time. I, I'm talking months, not years, before what we know as the world that we've known for our lifetime rapidly begins to fall apart. Uh, economics is going to be the basis of it. We're looking at a collapse of the world economy unlike anything ever known in history. Um, the collapse of the U.S. dollar. And, I mean, even nature is at work here, too. There's a global drought that's going on currently in Africa, North Central China, South America, Western United States, um, in many cases, these droughts are historic. They're more severe than than for than for many years. In some cases, more severe than at any time in recorded history. The southeastern United States as well, Georgia. Mm -hmm. uh, Georgia is also undergoing a drought. Um, uh, so there's more at work than just human intervention in terms of the economic markets. And um, we're going to see serious, serious food shortages globally. And I'm talking about right here in River City. Um, I myself have lived through several hurricanes. I live in Louisiana. And uh, one thing that happens, as soon as people panic and realize the hurricane is coming, well, you can be assured the grocery shelves empty, the gas pumps empty. And uh, when the economic panic hits, you can expect similar things to begin to happen. And, and the fact is, is that uh, we have been, uh, since 2004, the developed nations had 47 million tons in storage inventories of food supplies. As of 2008, it was down to 27 million tons, and they're expecting that to be gone through the first half of this year. There is no replenishment coming from our foreign suppliers. 
because they're many of the major bread baskets in the, around the world are undergoing severe droughts, severe reduction in productivity. So preparing yourself to for what's coming not only means spiritually, which is important, but also physically and uh, taking well, steps to prepare yourself. In your, in your uh, next book that's, that we'll be working with, the final event, you do give a very nice outline at the end of that. And um, we can get into that more in, in yeah. further... Yep. in further classes, but it's a heads up and, and uh, I'm sure many people will appreciate that. Well, I think it's time to draw to a close this second class and once again to thank you, Robert Cox, for all the work you've done to be able to bring this knowledge to our awareness and share it with all of us. It's quite an extraordinary experience. Uh, my pleasure, Deborah, and uh, looking forward to the next session. Me too.